before I get started on this presentation. So thanks everyone for attending and welcome to this Edinburgh Instruments presentation on the photoluminescence characterization of perovskite semiconductors. I'm sure for the majority of people in the audience that perovskites need no introduction, but for those of you who are not familiar, in the most general sense, they refer to any compound that obeys the ABX3 crystal structure shown here. And the semiconductors of these materials exhibit excellent optoelectronic properties. And they're therefore being investigated for a wide range of optoelectronic devices, ranging from solar cells, light emitting diodes, laser gain materials, and photosensors. And in this presentation, I'm going to show how photoluminescence spectroscopy is an excellent technique for the characterization of these fascinating materials. In PL spectroscopy, the perovskite semiconductor is photoexcited, and this promotes electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. And in all forms of PL spectroscopy, what we want to do is monitor the radiative recombination of these electrons back to the valence band. And there's three main types of PL spectroscopy, steady state, time resolved, and quantum yield. And they each give you different types of information. And I'm going to go through each of these techniques in turn and highlight the different types of information you can obtain. And I'll start with steady state photoluminescence. In steady state photoluminescence, the perovskite is excited with a continuous wave source, usually a lamp or a laser. And the PL intensity is then monitored as a function of wavelength to obtain a photoluminescence spectrum. The Edinburgh Instruments FLS1000 is an ideal spectrometer for monitoring the photoluminescence of perovskite semiconductors. The FLS1000 is a highly modular spectrometer and it can be equipped with a wide range of excitation sources and detectors depending on your specific perovskite application. So for example, for steady state photoluminescence, you can either use a xenon arc lamp, which is then wavelength selected using an excitation monochromator, or you could also equip the spectrometer with a high power CW laser for single wavelength excitation. And depending on the emission wavelength of your photoluminescence, there's a wide range of detector options available uh, from the deep UV into the mid IR. So to cover a wide range of perovskite band gaps. So some examples of the type of information that you can obtain using steady state PO spectroscopy. One of the most popular is to use it for uh, interface engineering. So you can monitor the change in your photoluminescence properties, depending on the different materials in your perovskite device stack, either a solar cell stack or an OLED stack. So in the example shown here, there's two photoluminescence spectra measured. So the red one is for this stack. So we have perovskite deposited on the whole transport layer and then your ITO electrode. And the blue curve is the same stack, but now with an interlayer of PFN. And you can see that when the interlayer of PFN is added, that the photoluminescence intensity decreases. And this shows that PFN uh, promotes whole efficient hole transfer uh, into the, the poly TPD or hole transport layer. Uh, and therefore this will make a more efficient uh, perovskite device. So the lower the photoluminescence means that the, the holes must be escaping. And so lower photoluminescence means more efficient hole transfer in this case. But this general principle of monitoring the relative PL intensity between different perovskite stacks 
can be applied to a wide range of different changes, such as different annealing temperatures, different solvents, and doing a similar comparison. And the photoluminescence properties then correlate to the electrical properties of the solar cell. Another example of where steady state photoluminescence can be used is looking at phase transitions. Perovskites can exist in different phases, depending on the temperature, and the spectrometer can be therefore be equipped with a cryostat. And you can monitor the change in photoluminescence as a function of temperature and an automated temperature map. And using this information, you can plot a curve such as this, which shows the change in the photoluminescence wavelength as a function of temperature, which allows you to identify the location of the phase transitions. The next type of spectroscopy that I'm going to talk about is time-resolved photoluminescence. So in time-resolved photoluminescence, a similar principle, the Perovskite is excited, but now we want to monitor the time it takes for the radiative recombination to occur. And the FLS 1000 can be equipped with time correlated single photon counting electronics and a wide range of laser sources to excite the sample, such as our EPL series of pulse diode lasers. And so there's a wide range of wavelengths available depending on the excitation wavelength required. In a time resolved photoluminescence measurement, the perovskite is excited, and then the photoluminescence decay is monitored as a function of time. And this gives you information on the charge carrier lifetime of the perovskite. So in the example shown here, this was mephalomonium lead iodide, and the different colors are different annealing times. And we can see that as the annealing time is increased from 15 to 60 minutes, that the average life, uh, photoluminescence lifetime increases. And therefore, the 60 minute anneal should give the most efficient uh, perovskite device, as we've extended the photoluminescence lifetime and decreased non radiative recombination. The, the last of the photoluminescence techniques that I'm going to discuss is photoluminescence quantum yield. So the photoluminescence quantum yield is the ratio of the number of photons emitted to the number of photons absorbed, or more fundamentally, it's a ratio of the radiative and non-radiative recombination rates. And this is very important for both light emitting devices, such as LEDs and solar cells, because the efficiency of an LED is proportional to the PLQI, and the open circuit voltage of a solar cell also depends on the photoluminescence quantum yield. You want no non-radiative recombination. And the best way to measure the photoluminescence quantum yield is to use an integrating sphere. So in an integrating sphere, the sample is excited and both the photoluminescence that's emitted and the scattered excitation light bounces off the walls of the sphere and is rescattered and is then enters the emission monochromator and is detected. And by scanning over both the excitation peak and the emission peak, you can take these ratios and calculate the photoluminescence quantum yield of your device. And generally for perovskite semiconductors, you want you can use this to optimize your materials. So if you want to rapidly screen different materials for light emitting diodes or solar cells, you can check which materials give the best photoluminescence quantum yield, and they should also give a good optoelectronic device performance. And the FLS 1000 can be equipped with two integrating spheres. We have a room temperature uh, sphere for standard photoluminescence measurements, and also a variable temperature triosphere, which allows you to monitor the PLQI from 77 to 500 Kelvin.
The last thing I'm going to discuss in this presentation is photoluminescence mapping. So all the techniques that I've showed so far were effectively single point measurements, but very commonly you want to monitor the photoluminescence of your device uh, and get spatial information on where that PL occurs. And Edinburgh Instruments also has a, what's the RMS 1000 Raman and PL microscope that allows you to do photoluminescent mapping of your devices. So an example to demonstrate the power of photoluminescence mapping was the investigation of this uh, solar cell stack. So this is a, a proskite stack that has an ITO with carbon nanotubes as a whole transfer layer. And just an SEM managed to show these vertical end carbon nanotubes. And we can use photoluminescence mapping to show what effect these carbon nanotube whole extraction layers have on the performance of the device. So this is just a dark field image taken with the microscope of the RMS 1000. But if we then change this to photoluminescence mode, you can see that the PL intensity is highest in the regions where the carbon nanotubes are not present. And the PL intensity decreases on top of the nanotubes, showing that there's whole extraction occurring. And the data shown here is a true spatial spectral map. So each point in this image has a spectrum. It's not simply an intensity map. So we can then also extract the spectra at various points that have been measured using the CCD camera of the microscope. So it gives you both spatial and spectral information on the perovskite. One question though is, is the photoluminescence intensity reduced uh, due to whole transfer or is it due to less perovskite being deposited on top of these islands? And we can confirm that whole transfer is occurring by using photoluminescence lifetime mapping as a complementary technique. So here, the same lasers are used to do a TCSPC measurement to measure time result photoluminescence. So again, we start off with a microscope image and you can see the carbon nanotube islands. And then we can take a photoluminescence lifetime map of this area. And so here, bright color means high uh, or long average lifetime. Dark color means a shorter average lifetime. And you can see the extracted decays that a region uh, with high average lifetime and low average lifetime here. So this map is composed with a series of PL decays and then to produce this color plot and you can extract the decays and fit lifetimes. And this shows that the average PL lifetime decreases when you're on top of the carbon nanotubes. And this is a second confirmation that whole transfer is occurring on these nanotube islands. From the scientific side, I hope that's been useful for you and that's all I want to show. Uh, just a quick word of who we are for those of you who are not familiar with the company. Uh, so Edinburgh Instruments is based near Edinburgh, Scotland, and we've been manufacturing scientific instrumentation for the past 40 years. And we manufacture a range of instrumentation for molecular spectroscopy. So the photoluminescence uh, steady state and lifetime that I showed in this talk, but also UV vis absorption, transient absorption, and Raman and photoluminescence microscopes. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or you can ask them in the chat function.